working on the concept of the voice of the Lord. And our focus on this idea of the voice of the Lord that we're going to be looking at this evening is not just does God speak, but um, basically how to recognize what we call the rhythm. <sighs> rhythm of guidance. Okay, so there's a rhythm to the voice of the Lord that when God speaks, there's a certain way that he does it. So, as I was sharing with a couple people before we started the class, and this will be a good thing for us, when we talk about this term, the voice of the Lord, it's a Greek word, phemai. And the word phemai is used in prophecy. This is, you put a pro in front of it, and that's where you get the word prophecy. But this means when it's by itself and it's talking about the voice of the Lord, it carries the idea of a voice that can be heard. Or the, the negative connotation is it cannot be ignored. So when God speaks, when God speaks, he has an impact on you, and you recognize it's him. It, it's, it means that it's a different quality of voice, a higher standard of an impact. It means it's so unique that when God speaks to you, it's hard for you to say, I don't, I don't know if it was the Lord or not. Uh, that's the impact it's supposed to have on you. So we discovered this last month when we talked about this. If it's a voice that cannot be ignored then it should produce uh, an impact or what we would call an experience of fruit. But what does that follow? That follows Galatians 5.22. So we see that God gives a, a, a what's called a, 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 an impact on my soul, and it produces the nature and the quality of God's presence. And we follow, we would say, well, what is God's presence? Well, we get out of Galatians 5.22, the Holy Spirit produces the same fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. So, also, we discovered last time that when God speaks, it connects with the principles, or maybe we didn't cover this last time, but it follows the principle of the Logos that God has given us, which is what we describe as the Bible. God has spoken, in fact, we even know in the Psalms that God's word is declared and settled in heaven. So that book, or however you guys have it in whatever form, that is God's thoughts about things. The reason why we don't keep adding more books to the Bible is because in those books, God has given us what we would call the things that you need to know, to know him, to walk with him, to receive salvation, and to prepare for the afterlife. All that stuff is given to us in the scripture. Everything you need to walk your Christian life is given to us in scripture. So there's no point for him to add to it. So the next thing is, is when the voice that it, it cannot be, I mean, can be heard or not ignored, it produces fruit, it follows the principle of the Logos. And now this gets down to the nitty gritty. How does the voice of God come? It comes as thoughts. And you have to learn to, when God gives a thought, and this is based out of what we see when we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, when it talks about words of knowledge, words of wisdom. Those Greek words that are used are a form of the word logos. And when, like I think I shared, maybe I didn't with you guys, when the word logos is used, if we were talking about philosophy, which I know you love studying, logos means the logic. So it reflects, God's thoughts reflect his mind, how he thinks. So most people don't like me saying this, but it's actually true. God is the most logical being in the universe. All right, so when you hear his thoughts, they're logical. They comport with reality. Okay, so that's on the philosophical side. On the part of you and I walking with the Lord, the word also means a thought that becomes a word of knowledge, a thought thought that becomes a word of wisdom. So how does God's voice come to us? Thoughts. Now, most people, when we say, go hear God, they don't know what to expect. And I'm telling you, God is already speaking to you. The Bible even says that God is having a con constant conversation with mankind. The problem isn't God speaking, it's man doesn't recognize it. So what does that tell you about your soul? Your soul 
can actually be filled with all kinds of junk so that you cannot recognize the voice of the Lord. So I'm just going to be working on two things with you when we talk about the things that keep you from recognizing that God is speaking to you. You guys ready? First one is this. We're going to get to the scripture, I promise, but we need to go over this. So uh, the first principle that we need to do that keeps you from recognizing God's thoughts or God speaking to you comes to us out of Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. So if you guys would turn there, we're going to look at the two things that Jesus says is going on and then a solution, okay? Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. I think it's 28. Hopefully I quote this correctly. If it isn't, it's 29. So Jesus is standing in front of the human race, and he's basically saying something. Come unto me, all that, all that are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in spirit, right? Okay, so he's telling you what he's like, and he's telling you what you're experiencing living in a fallen world, and he's saying, for you to recognize me and for you to grow in me, I need to produce my life inside of you. You're dealing with weariness and heavy laden, and I come and I bring my presence, and I remove that from you, and then you come into humility and rest, and that's the lifestyle of the kingdom of God. So, weariness. And what the heavy laden, heavy laden. Uh, okay, one of these is called the outward effect of living in a fallen world, and the second one is the inward effect of living in a fallen world. So you guys and I are all dealing with this now by living in a fallen world. All humanity needs to come to the Son of God and receive his life. Not just in salvation. By the way, that passage is not just a salvation statement. He's talking with you and I about living in a fallen world and the, the effect it actually has on you. There's an effect of living in a fallen world, whether it's spiritual warfare or just being among fallen humanity, right? It causes an effect, and it's called weariness and heavy laden. So weariness creates, ready? Now I'm going to use biblical terms and then give you the terms that we use today. It creates this concept called anxiety. And anxiety, you'll find that the word worry, anxiety, and fear are the same Greek word. They just translate it different to make it, instead of just saying fear, 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 they translate it anxiety, worry, fear. But it's all phobia, it's the word phobia, and it actually means that because of living in a fallen world and looking at the effect of what sin has done to humanity, it brings doubt and anxiety to you that what? God is not in control. And it produces anxiety around you. Have you guys uh, seen that when you watch people? Uh, you could, if you wanna, if you wanna, real quick, what I would call Christian worldview of what's going on in reality, just turn on the nightly news and watch how they talk about people just running around in just utter chaos because of this reality. Okay? Now, heavy laden is actually interesting because this is more of a Greek word that has to do with what's going on in your soul. Now, do you guys realize that the main problem isn't just anxiety and fear? It, the Bible actually equates it, and so, ready? I'll just do a, a simple ladder like this. The Bible equates reality like this. The highest order of everything that's going on in the universe comes from what? The spirit realm. Now you're taught culturally there's no spirit realm, so everything's in the natural realm. So the highest realm of reality is the spirit realm, right? This is, this is where we get all our battles. This is where everything changes. If we can change what's going on in the spirit realm, it affects the physical realm. You've been taught culturally Use the power of your flesh. If you change it in the natural realm, they will change it in these realms. But there are people that are trying to change stuff that if they don't deal with this issue first, they won't get any of the other things that they're looking for. And if you want fun, go to Mexico, South America, Africa, Asia even. And they their worldview is based on that reality, that they believe the spiritual realm is the highest order. It's only in Europe, England, United States, and Canada that we have this really screwed up anti-supernatural worldview that messes with that. So, heavy laden comes, the first concept of the Greek word that's used is the word for oppression. 
So it's working on the spiritual component of what goes on in your soul. So Jesus is trying to deal with this. The reason why you cannot recognize him speaking to you is because you get anxiety by living in a fallen world and it presses in on you. And it also has a spiritual dimension. It brings oppression. Now, do you guys know what the Greek word for oppression means? Like if I looked at you, Randy, and said, what is the definition for the word oppression? What would you say to me? <clears throat> Being held back or down. Yeah, that's right. Now, uh, in the Greek New Testament, the word for oppression is really fascinating. It does mean that, but it actually means it's a spirit. So it actually, the first part of the Greek word for oppression means a power, an intentional power to press down. And the power to press you down is for a specific purpose to keep you from actualizing your destiny. Isn't that interesting? So look at what Matthew 11, we, I'm, wow, I'm doing all the teaching on this and you get to the scripture I'm at. But Matthew 11 is telling you, this is why people cannot recognize the voice of the Lord, because they have weariness that has a, a, is more powerful in their life than the presence of the Lord, and they're being oppressed spiritually, and it's weighing down upon them. And Jesus tells you to come to him for an exchange. So you guys ready? He doesn't tell you you have to try to figure out how to live with anxiety and worry, and he doesn't tell you you need to just fight as hard as you can to get oppression on you. He says, come to me and I will give you rest. And the way the Greek word is used there, he's not saying I will give rest like a part of me, it actually, the rest is tied to his presence. So he's actually saying, I'll give you myself and it'll create rest. Mm -hmm. And then you'll recognize his kingdom so you can recognize his voice. It's humble and gentle and it'll, it'll nurture your soul. So our job when it comes to the voice of the Lord and the rhythm of guidance, which we're going to now look at in Exodus 15, 26, is this process. God is trying to help you recognize that his thoughts are coming to you. The, the two of the problems, there's a whole series of things that could be going on, but the two main problems is you're, you're dealing with your weariness from the outward world, and you're dealing with the spiritual impression, and it makes you just, uh, you're running like a marathon inside, so when God is trying to give you his thoughts, you can't recognize it's him. Just like you can't recognize when the enemy is speaking to you when your soul's in this state. You think it's your thoughts. By the way, how many were trained in psychology? Okay, Lee was. I'm so sorry. We need to get together <laughs> with each other and stuff. Yeah. So when I was trained in psychology, they tried to tell you, you know, uh, this stuff doesn't, this isn't how man thought. This is only since Sigmund Freud. They tell you that since they don't believe in a supernatural realm, all thoughts originate from your own soul, which that's a lie. Thoughts come from the spirit realm. You can have thoughts from the Lord. You can have thoughts from the enemy. And you can have your own soul and where you're having your consciousness where you hear thoughts, right? Yeah. So when everyone says, gosh, I just have such evil thoughts. I'm such an evil person. And it's because of the culture we live in, they don't know how to discern that and go, oh, that might actually be a demonic spirit. Mm -hmm. And since they, and you guys, this is a simple test. If a thought comes to you to do something evil and you don't want to do it, you can't have this schizophrenic thing going on inside of you that Sigmund Freud's trying to tell you. Mm -hmm. By the way, he made all that junk up, right? right? He loved Darwin. You guys realize that? So your subconscious mind is you being an animal and you're trying to suppress it. I'm just telling you where these weirdos come up with this junk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this idea that there's this, an that must be what my sin nature is, I'm this animal and I want to express it and my higher conscious has to suppress this all the time. And you guys, Sigmund Freud made all that junk up, snorted coke, and tried to seduce women all the time. So that's the person that made this junk up. Yeah. It has no basis in reality. It's just a bunch of nonsense that comes from the kingdom of darkness. Yeah. So if you have a thought that comes to you, you ought to go do something wicked, and you don't want to do it, that means it's not your thought. It's coming to you from somewhere else. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Did you enjoy that rant I did on Sigmund Freud? I enjoyed it. No one else usually does, but I always like taking a shot at that guy. All right. Well, if you ever study some of these guys, you, you just sit back in amazement and think, how can we build people to get degrees out of this absolute nonsense? I mean, it's just nonsense. And people get PhDs and all this other stuff, and you think, have any of you ever gone and seen a psychologist? It's like the biggest waste of money you ever had. They have no <laughs> solutions to anything. Right. Sorry. Outside of them being able to sit there and listen to you and charge you a lot of money, they, they don't have the power to help you resolve almost any issue in your life. They just tell you to empower your flesh. Well, just grit, you know, grit your teeth and, and just stop doing it. Well, uh, I didn't need to pay you all that money for that. All right, Exodus 15, 26. 
hope you didn't think that was a rant, even though it was. <laughs> it was a good one. Okay. I'll get more into it when I teach on inner healing, and then you'll really enjoy me going after it. So, what is going on in this passage, just so we know it? Exodus 15 is really fascinating to give you a historical concept of what's going on here. The nation of Israel has been delivered from Egypt. God has brought judgment on this nation that is oppressing the children of Israel. God favors them and sets them apart. All the judgments that God brings on that, uh, the nation of Egypt, he doesn't do it to the nation of Israel, and he begins to define them as his people. Then, you guys realize they were raised in the Egyptian culture. They had been nurtured in false gods. So Egypt at that time was a pantheistic nation. They worshipped gods for sun and harvest and sex and anything you can think of, they had a god for it. And it was a form of intense idol worship. So God is bringing a whole entire group of people out of idol worship. And he says, okay, so now I want you to come and meet me. That was that whole idea of the Exodus story. They do all these things. God takes them through the ocean, splits the ocean. They walk through God buries the Egyptian army in it, and God sets them free. So now in the natural, he has separated them from uh, pantheism, right? Now he takes them into the wilderness, and the process of it is so that they would know what he is like. I mean, if you guys don't enjoy the Exodus story, everything that he brought them to is what you and I go through in the New Testament. He is trying to show you that he is sufficient in every area of your life. Mm -hmm. But you don't know it until you're brought into a situation where you need to realize that. Okay, so the first thing that God does, and there's two places before the Ten Commandments where God declares his name to the nation of Israel, and in Exodus 15 is the first time he does it. So, you guys, he brings them to, the, there's four, they think there was between four to eight million people that God brought out of Egypt. So I'm just going to use 4.5 for the fun of it. 4.5 million people, they need a drink of water, and they don't have it. And they come to this lake, and they find out it's poisonous. And so what do they do? They complain to Moses that God brought them there to kill them. And by the way, every time they went to a trial, they always said the same thing. God brought us here to kill us. <laughs> it's, it's almost like a, a comedy show. Listen to these guys. And, you, and I don't know if you're like this, Dominic, but most, I, I read those stories and I'd say, I'd never do that. And then inevitably, every time I go through it, I do the exact same thing. So it's kind of humbling to read these things. So God brings, they need, now what is the idea of fresh water? We're like, well, these are, you know, these are farmers and, I mean, they didn't have like modern plumbing and all that other junk. But what's the real issue about them needing a drink of water? God being their resource, right? It's the, the thing is about God being a resource. In fact, it was not only that, it was God being a resource and a God of miracle at the same time. So they needed miraculous resources released to them so that they, because the water, it wasn't that they didn't have water, it was polluted and poisonous. So there needed to be a reversal of that. Okay. So God brings them down to the water, they complain, and then God said, I brought you here intentionally. Now let's look at the passage and see what he says to them. Now, usually when you teach this, you have to go to the point where he declares his name Jehovah Rapha. But we're not looking at that this evening. We're looking at him talking about his voice. So he says, he said to them, this is verse 26. Now, this is what he said. I brought you here to see if you will, and then he says this, if you will give earnest heed to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight and give ear to his commandments. <clears throat> And keep all his statues. I will not, I will put none of the diseases on you which I put on the Egyptians, for I, the Lord, am your healer. Now, I, I was trying to give you the historical record. What commandments is he talking about here? Because he has not given the Ten Commandments yet. <laughs> well, the reason I did that, I'm not trying to do Bible trivia with you. I'm trying to help you understand something. He said, I brought this here, and this is a statue and an ordinance from this time on with my people. So even though the Ten Commandments had not been given, and Aaron didn't set up all the rabbinical laws, and none of that was in place, he was giving them an ordinance that they had to do the rest of the time that they were the people of God through the generations. That's why he said... I want you to obey my commands, follow my ordinances, do what I, I tell you to do, live righteously before me, right? But he doesn't start by saying, 
only obey the vo all, only obey my commands and follow my statutes. And this is where people get really confused. They're, the God is actually telling the children of Israel they need to listen to the voice of the Lord and do what he tells them to do. Isn't that amazing? So here in the Old Testament, God is saying, I'm going to lead you by my voice. Now, in the day and age we live in, just so we can work through this, has God ever changed his mind on that idea? <clears throat> nope. Okay. Now we have the, the scripture. Could we actually ignore the first part of what the Lord is saying here and get to be just like the people in the Old Testament? And this is the problem they kept having, is they had God tell them stuff. They'd write it down and they'd say, we don't need to hear the voice of the Lord anymore because we've got this. Could we do the same thing? Could we just be people that follow laws and commandments and statue without obeying the voice of the Lord? Mm -hmm. In fact, even convince ourselves that we're obeying the voice of the Lord by following laws, statutes, and commands. So this is talking about an active relationship with his people. That has never changed. There's nowhere in the scripture where you can say that's changed. And that's why I'm pointing it out to you guys. So look what it says here. It doesn't say just listen to the voice of the Lord. It says, if you will give earnest heed to the voice of the Lord your God. That's the first thing he's commanded you to do, to give earnest heed. And then he says this, and do what is right in his sight. So we'll deal with those two things now. Where's the word earnest heed? It's actually interesting in the Hebrew, when it does that concept, earnest heed, it's called a double emphasis Hebrew word, which means it's actually the same Hebrew word, but they didn't translate it that, they just translated earnest heed. <laughs> it could be actually earnest earnest or heed heed, and so it's called a double emphasis. So why is God saying this? All right, so think about what's being said in the passage. I, this is a high priority, you need to listen to me. Okay, so he's actually telling you that the top priority of your walk with the Lord is not to wake up and decide how you're going to walk with the Lord. Your job is to hear him. So you're called to actually, and that's why there's the emphasis, you're to hear the Lord. And this earnest heed, this emphasis on it means this is, um, not only are you to hear the Lord, this is to become what's called a focus of your walk with him. This is the focus of what God has called you to. Now, I don't know how you guys think about your walk with the Lord. How many, uh, do you guys, I mean, uh, Randy can ask you this question. Do you wake up every day and say, well, my goal is not to sin? Generally, no. Okay. Do you wake up and say, my goal is to read 10 chapters a day? No. Okay. How do you think about your walk with the Lord when you wake up every day? Uh, generally speaking, I give him praise and thank him for what I've done. So you worship. I ask him, okay. you know, what so you don't say, "Well, I better get some coffee, and then I'll, and then at, at once I wake up, I might think about the Lord, and I might go study the Scripture." You don't do any of that kind of stuff. Generally, no. Before I okay. Get out of Gosh, you're more. I need you to lay hands on me later. Okay. So when you wake up, do you wake up and say, "Well, I'm going to try to do these things," or how do you focus? I mean, what do you think about when you wake up every day and it's time for you to know the Lord? Okay, so you, you go through a process of connecting with him somehow. How about you? Okay. Gosh, you guys, you're, you're giving me a different response than I thought you would. So I wake up every day thinking, okay, so my goal is to fulfill the Great Commission, and I'm having the Lord himself saying, no, the focal point is for you to hear me today. And then what I tell you to do, you're supposed to do that. So that would be kind of the idea of what Jesus was teaching the disciples, right? When he said, pick up your cross daily and follow me. And so here he's telling us in the Old Testament, your focus is to hear from the Lord. But that's a different focus, isn't it? The second point of this, you guys have any thoughts about that? So that means that my, my engaging with the Lord is not so much to try to get an A mark by my name in the internal book of life because I did all the right religious activities that day. What God is requiring for me is to connect it with him in relationship and hear from him. So we always do this, and you guys enjoy when I do this to you. Can you hear the voice of the Lord every day and expect God to guide you? Okay, so you, these guys agree. You guys kind of looked at me and went, I don't know, Brian. <laughs> uh, now remember, <clears throat> he commanded this. So this must mean this is pretty important to him. So if I have this belief system that I can only hear God on Sunday, 
or at special conferences, I'm missing the focal point of this. This is why whenever the voice of the Lord is being used in both the Old and New Testament, it's trying to use it in relational concepts of intimacy because God is the first focus. And the first focus, isn't this amazing? It didn't say the first focus is for you to have a vision. It says your first focus is to hear him. Right? So that means that if I get that and I understand that, that means that I have to change my walk with the Lord, and my goal isn't to try to do something to make myself feel pleasing to the Lord. My goal is to connect so I can hear from it, whatever that takes. And I could talk to you guys about meditation. I, I have covered that. But I could talk to you about meditation. I could talk to you about visions. I could talk to you about spending quiet time with the Lord. I could talk to you about reading the scripture and hearing the Lord. I could give you all those things, but the focal point, whatever God needs to give you in whatever season you're in, that's what you need to do because your call is to hear the voice of the Lord. So God now is emphasizing this here in this passage for the whole entire nation. Now, I don't know if you guys ever thought about this. How, when you look at the Exodus story, don't you think the person that has to hear the voice of the Lord is Moses, not the people of Israel? Yeah. And yet he's telling all of them, you're all required to do this. <laughs> In fact, he said, I brought you here intentionally to tell you, you all have to hear me. And you guys, uh, the one thing that's so fun about the children of Israel is he tells them to do that. And then he, you know, another Exodus story, he says, okay, I need to bring the fear of the Lord among these people. So Moses tells everyone to purify themselves for two days. And then I'm going to come over this cloud. And I'm, just, I'm going to manifest my glory to get them to have the fear of the Lord. He does it. And everybody's just shaking, ah, and then they say, we don't need to hear from the Lord, you go hear from the Lord. So the very thing he told them, this is what you're to do, they said, I don't like that plan, you go do it. You guys see that, right? Now Moses, you guys see this from the life of Moses, Moses modeled this every day. So what did he give the first part of his day to, do you guys know? I mean, you could see it from the life of Moses. Have you ever looked at it? Like, Lee, if I asked you, what, did, what is the first part of his day? Do you know what he did? Communing with God. Yeah, how did he do it? Do you know? Um, no, he went and yeah, that's right. Went. So, um, you ready for this fun statement? He spent the first part of his day hearing from the Lord, and then the second part of the day walking out what he was being led to do. And everything that was going on around the children of Israel was given a physical reality of a spiritual truth he was trying to get across to them. So how is he trying to get them that they need to hear from him every day? He begins to feed them by manna and the bread that's spiritual they can only eat for the day and they can't save it for the next day. So he's now giving them a symbolic supernatural experience to show them this is living bread you have to get it every day. I feel like I'm talking to me now. But do you, guys, do you guys realize that? So there have been certain saints through church history that figured this out, and they would actually give themselves in the morning to connecting with the Lord before they went and did anything, and they make statements about it. Some of my favorite guys that I try to emulate in my life said, you could do more by hearing from the Lord than you ever can not hearing from the Lord. There's a grace that comes on you when you hear him, and he tells you to do something, and you obey more than you struggling trying to do stuff and get God to enter into it. Why am I saying that? Well, back to the thing of the scripture I had up here. Because when you come to hear from the Lord, you get the benefit of the kingdom value and the kingdom manifestation of rest. And it's a grace-empowered rest, and it comes out of the miraculous realm. And then God enters into your daily experience because you're being led by the voice of the Lord, and because you're obedient, the blessing of God is released on everything you put your hands to. <sighs> guess I needed to hear that. Okay, so look at the second part of this. Give in earnest heed to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight. Okay, so the word right here for right is really kind of interesting. It actually, the, this isn't just um, back to commands. This isn't back, in fact, it's not even talking about commands. The word right here is used as a Hebrew word. It actually means a path. So what, do what is right. It actually means that God shows you a path for your life, and to do what is right, God says something to you, and in a sense, it puts you on a path, and the idea is you follow the path until the voice comes and tells you to change directions on the path. So 
Um, if I, when I say this to you guys, all of you should just give me a resounding, come on, that's so basic. How can you even teach that kind of nonsense? But you guys ready? There's not a place in scripture where it talks about hearing the voice of the Lord as a form of inter entertainment and not doing what he tells you to do. Those are, those are not ideas in the Bible. Every time that God tells you to do, uh, talks to you, he's leading you and you're supposed to obey. <laughs> it's so funny to say that there, a bunch of Christians. I mean, that's just obvious, right? God doesn't like tell you something for entertainment. He's not Google. <laughs> Okay, you don't say, how do you want me to deal with my finances? And he says, okay, well, what I want you to do is I want you to start giving 10% of your money to this, and then I want you to start buying commodities over here and then get gold and silver, and you go, well, that's a great idea. I'll never do it. <laughs> I mean, you guys get it? He's not giving him information to say, I know these things, and I'm powerful, and then you go, well, I'm just not going to obey it. Okay, so the second point of it is this. When God speaks, you have to know... Engage your will to do whatever he's leading you to do. Now, here's the mystery and the joy of it all. Until you do it, you're not going to have God talk to you about anything else until you do it. So if you try to go, now this, I'm going to save you just millions of dollars right now. And money on airline tickets and everything else. Because there's this weird belief system in the body of Christ that when God is not speaking to me, even though he told me to do something and I'm not doing it, we say, well, I probably didn't hear the Lord correctly, so I'm going to go find the most powerful prophetic minister I can and have him give me a word, right? So they spend all this money to get on a plane and go to that guy, hoping he gives them a word, and then he gives them a word, and lo and behold, it's the exact same thing God told you three months ago, and you're not doing it. I shouldn't say you guys aren't doing it. Let me personalize this. I'm not doing it, right? And so... Um, to constantly ask God to give you new information and you're not walking it out, you're missing the idea of walking on a path with the Lord. Uh, any of you ever have to go to some address you've never been to and you punch in the address on your phone and then all of a sudden the phone maps out the thing for you and then you hit go. Have you guys ever done that? Mm -hmm. And when you're first starting out, it tells you now turn right on this corner and then Go two blocks and turn left, and then go three miles and then turn right. And then you get on the highway. And what happens when you get on the highway? It says, now go 75 miles. And then you don't hear anything for another 75 miles. You just have to stay on the highway. If you get off to go to a convenience store to buy something, the thing will start talking to you again. Get back on the highway and go 34 miles, and then you'll hear again, right? Then when you're getting close to the, 70, the mark of the 75 miles, and it, then the voice starts speaking to you again. Okay, in two miles, turn right at, at Highway 151. And as you get closer, you're getting closer. Get And turn, and turn, and turn. And then and you're, she's yelling at you, turn, turn, turn. Right? <laughs> okay. Well, we've, we've created technology, and what it reflects is how God leads people. God says, okay, so, Dominic, hypothetically, you're supposed to be a leader in the body of Christ. So he says, okay, you're supposed to be a leader. And you go, okay, Lord. And he goes, now go over here and study this. And then you, so you go over there and you buy whatever you need to start studying. Now, is there, does God need to talk to you every day about doing that thing? Depending, if he's teaching you, he'll commune with you about it, give you insight. Yeah, that's great, stuff like that. Then he says, okay, now put the books down for a while and go over to this group and start serving. Well, you talked to me about being ultimately this big leader in the body of Christ, but you've got me going over here. It's because you're, you're mapping, he's mapping you out to get you to where you need to go. Mm -hmm. And this is the thing about hearing the voice of the Lord. If we realize our focus is to hear and then to do, we can trust him to get us to our ultimate destiny and fulfill what God has called us to do. In fact, I want to really drive this home to you guys how important this is. God set this up as a statue with his people and said this is a statue and an ordinance, which means this is a law that you have to obey the rest of your life. You are commanded to actively hear the voice of the Lord and do what he's telling you to do. Why? Because it's your safeguard and it empowers you your whole entire life to go down the path that God has created you to be in. And when you're in that path, guess what happens? You're protected from everything that's there to destroy you. It's your safety. 
<laughs> okay. Questions or comments will go on to the rest of the passage. Okay. So look, grab the passage with me. We're doing good on time. Thank the Lord. No questions? All right, so look at it here. And then it says, do what is right in sight and give ears to his commandments. So this is interesting. The idea of giving ears is meaning that God is going to use his word at strategic time to turn you or lead you. That whole idea of the map thing I was talking, turn right here, turn left there. Sometimes when you're going a certain direction, God wants to enhance it and tell you things to get you going faster or propelling you or to release more grace in your life. So he'll say things like, you know, while you're going down this road, it'd be a good idea if you stop backbiting people. And you're like, really? Every, every other Christian does it. And he's like, well, it's, it's like you're putting sugar in your gas tank. You really need to stop doing that. Mm -hmm. And, you, and uh, you guys do what I do? While everybody's on their path, I'm always pointing at the person and going, Lord, but look at them. You didn't call them to do that. Do you guys ever do that stuff? And so why do I have to do this? Because God requires you, as you're going on the path that he's created for you, he's going to enhance it and empower you. The path isn't just a straight path to reach a designation. It's a path to go higher as you're going along. And so God enhances it by telling you, do this as an activity, make it a habit, do this, let this go, stop holding on to this. You have dirt on your windshield you can't see, so I need you to cleanse it for a while. And you're like, yeah, but I'm just trying to get down the road. And he's trying to get you down the road too. But there are some things that you're not aware of that he's going to command. Do this also. So when we talk about the commands and the statues of the Lord, the reason why we read the scripture, even though we're supposed to pursue the voice of the Lord, is because these things that kept them from going on their journeys are the exact same things that keep you from going on your journey. And it's just common knowledge of the journey. And so God has to say, well, go read that because I'm going to use that as a springboard to say, you know, change your oil periodically and fill your tires while you're doing it and, and wash the car every once in a while. <laughs> Do you guys get it? Mm -hmm. He's trying, he's saying, Everybody has to deal with this stuff, so go read what they had to deal with, so as you're on your own individual journey, I can enhance it. Make the car functional so you can get down there, and not only are you reaching where God is leading, you, you become more whole. It's actually like you get better as you get go along on the journey. Questions or comments? Okay, so you're, this is your focus, and you're, it, you're supposed to do what he tells you to do. Now. Um, let me finish up this. Isn't this funny? He's telling them all this stuff, and then he stops. Now, this is for the children of Israel specifically, and he says, Now, if you'll do this, I will not put on you the diseases that I put on the Egyptians. So you're going, Okay, I, I guess I better obey the voice of the Lord because I don't want their diseases. Why is he saying this? And then he, and then he stops, and then he says, And I'm your, I'm your restorer. Please get this. When I am not in alignment with the voice of the Lord, let's use a road here. Here God is speaking to me, and he's called me to go to this mountain right here, right? And here I am. And here's this journey that God has called me on. When he starts talking to me right here, and he tells me to do something, here I am going on this journey, he says, okay, so what I want you to do is I want you to go start a business, or go into the ministry, or whatever it is he's telling you to do, or forget that thing, or let that go. Whatever he does, when he speaks that to you, you're not only uh, hearing the voice of the Lord right here, what is happening is you're, you're, you're being put in a boundary of God's protection and in a boundary under his authority and his anointing. So he's actually saying you're protected. And the things that you could not get if you were not obeying me, I'm going to do. So in a sense, he's saying, you guys ready? If I told you you're going to go here, just like he did with Jesus, it doesn't matter how many demons or diseases come against you. You're in a protected place, and you should expect me to get you there if you're obeying me. That's the idea where he's telling them. If you'll obey me, I'm not going to put on you what they're putting on. He's actually saying, my voice is a boundary, and outside of his mouth, boundary is all the kingdom of darkness with all the junk that he does to people. The voice of the Lord protects you. Mm -hmm. Do you guys see that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's have a fun talk, because Liz is giving me a weird look. <laughs> Why does the voice of God protect you? Why? Yes. Why is this boundary created around you for protection when you're obeying the voice of the Lord? So 
we can walk according to his will. Okay. Yeah, I mean, so how would you answer that, Randy? If I said, why does the voice of God protect you from all this junk from the kingdom of darkness? Well, I also think it's because we are his children. Okay, so we're, uh, we're children. You want to take a shot? Why does the voice of the Lord protect you from stuff? To get to the mountain. To get to the mountain. Okay. Uh, do you want to take a shot? Why does the voice of the Lord protect you? My brain's gone. I'm <laughs> So you have brain slept. freeze? Okay. I have these slept. So okay, that's fine. Like on, like. <laughs> okay. Do you ever hear this thing called being in the will of God? Mm -hmm. So if you're in the will of God, you're under what's called the Psalms 91 reality. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. To have the manifest presence literally around you because you're in harmony with his kingdom is a form of protection. Mm. So when God says, hey, go do this, and you say yes, you've just invited the, and this overshadowing of the manifest presence of God over your life to actually sustain you, to get you there. Isn't that cool? Yeah. This is why it's not a good idea to argue and fight with the Lord and tell him no. Because <laughs> the minute you do that, you're pulled out of that. You grieve the Holy Spirit, and He, you repel him from you. Now, you like the Holy Spirit, right? I like the Holy Spirit. I do not want to repel the very thing that's the benefit of everything in my life. Now, you guys hear my stories where I, I'm always trying to tell God, I think it would be better to do it this way. Do you guys ever do that stuff? <laughs> or, Lord, that's not you telling me to do that, or all that kind of nonsense. But I, I've, I've understood this principle, and I've started connecting with it. The safest place for me to be is obeying what God has told me to do. The unsafest place to be in the universe is not obeying the voice of the Lord. I mean, let's have a real conversation with each other. For people out there that are not walking with the Lord, don't you cringe watching them live their everyday life? They have no protection at all. They're just getting pounded on morning, noon, and night. And then you say, hey, how'd you like to not be pounded on for a while? No, I don't like that. I, I like being pounded on by the king of a darkness and <laughs> having stress and all that. And you're like, good grief. How, how could someone want that? So, you guys ready? God has called you to this. He said, hey, this is actually the focus. This is what I want you to spend your time doing. Now, I will do the last of it. He tells them, if, you, if you'll do, uh, this is a command and an ordinance from this point on for all my people to make my voice their focus. And then you're to obey me. It'll protect you. And then he says, and I'm going to declare my name to you after you do this. And he says, I'm Jehovah Rapha. Well, that should tell you something. That also means that as you're, Yep. Oh, that was a hard stretch. As um, as you're oh, as you're walking with the Lord, there's two things about Him revealing His name to Him. He's actually revealing Himself. So it means that as I'm obeying, I'm getting a constant revelation of who the Lord is. And in this one, He actually says, "I'm the Lord who restores you." So do you guys remember when I said on the journey, you're not just trying to read the designation. The voice of the Lord brings you into meeting him as a restorer, and so you're going to get restored in the process of it. Have you guys ever, um, I know you will lay in bed at night thinking about this all the time, right? How do you go from being an immature Christian to a mature Christian? You got, is it a lot of Bible study and learning the Greek and the Hebrew? And by the way, just so we can cut to the quick of this, I know a lot of people that know Greek and Hebrew, and they have no wisdom. So just studying Greek and Hebrew doesn't make you have wisdom. So how does God mature somebody. He has to take them through a restorative process, right? And we always use this language, and I'm going to be straightforward. He has to build foundations in you. Well, how do you get foundations in you laid? By the voice of the Lord. <laughs> you don't get it by... I, let's see, Randy, tell me if you've ever had this experience. When I first got around healing... I just read it and read it and read it, and I couldn't get a breakthrough in it until the Lord spoke to me, because it's not just getting head knowledge, it has to come by revelation. Mm -hmm. yes. And what we've done, I don't know why we did this, I'm trying to figure out what century the body of Christ did this to each other, but what we've said is that it's enough that God spoke to them a couple thousand years ago, you don't need to hear from them. And we've created this really weird thing that God never intended for the body of Christ, that you weren't supposed to actively hear him your whole entire life. We've never emphasized that. We just say, read the book. 
Now, I don't have problems with reading the book. I read it all the time. But the book tells you, listen to them. Isn't that great? Questions or comments? Statements? It's, it's the Western mindset yep. as opposed to the Eastern mindset, yeah. which is more experiential. Western mindset we need to understand and know before it happens. Well, not only that, we think by reading and comprehending it, we've experienced it. Right. And, that, and that's not true either. Uh, this is where everyone, I, I'm sorry I'm doing this, but we're going to be praying for each other in physical healing. This is where everyone gets confused when they read scriptures on healing, they think they possess it. And well, you're like, how does that disconnect work in your head? It's showing you that God actively showed up and healed them. It wasn't just because they understood he was healer that they got healed. He has to actually show up and heal. Isn't that weird I have to say that to a group of people? So you can read all the scriptures morning, noon, and night about him healing. If he doesn't show up and heal, you're never going to get healed, even though you know right. every scripture on healing. <laughs> That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Same thing about this. You can see God speaking to people all over the place, but if he doesn't come to you and speak to you, you're stuck. Isn't that great? Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> That's why he talks about being a light under our path. The, the, the ways of the Lord are good is because he's actively doing this. And so this passage and our focus of this passage is hearing. It's your focus and then doing. There, you walk into what's called the blessing of the Lord. So that kind of negates a principle where they tell you, oh, just start um, prophesying scripture over yourself over and over, just say the <laughs> scriptures, right? That's yeah. what you're saying. It's like, unless the Lord shows up and does it, yeah. I you can speak all or claim and I'm, quote all the scriptures. I'm having fun right? with you when I say this thing I'm about to say to you. Are you ready? <laughs> Who are they? Where are you getting these interesting teachings? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's true. Yeah. Yeah. No, I know it's true. That's why I'm asking you. Where are you getting this interesting teaching where they give these weird concepts? Um, <laughs> I'll see it on tape. Oh, okay. <laughs> It must be the heretical group of the month or something like that. So, okay, so are you guys... Um, I've heard it. I've never, I've never believed it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? And I'm having fun with you when I talk. Yeah. But, you know, if you don't resolve this, mm -hmm. you're going to teach a whole group. If you're a leader and you become a teacher in the body of Christ, you're going to teach people to memorize principles, and then you're going to try to teach them how to walk it out in the flesh instead of being led by the Lord. And you're going to find out they're going to be frustrated all the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because if you don't get them back to the basics where they have to hear from the Lord, recognize it, and connect it to the Word, they're just going to have all kinds of hit and misses, and scriptures aren't going to make sense to them. They're just really going to struggle. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, <clears throat> questions, comments? By the way, just so you guys know, this uh, when you teach on hearing the voice of the Lord, this is not a charismatic thing. This is a Christianity thing. I've gone through the greater body of Christ, and Presbyterians talk about hearing the voice of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Episcopals, Catholics, Anglicans, everyone, everyone, unless they're totally heretical, all believe they can be guided by the Lord. It's just how. Some only say in Scripture, some say by the peace of God, peace and the Scripture, stuff like that. It depends on what group takes it to the higher standard of just being biblical. Some groups just, I can't expect an angel to speak to me because I'm an unworthy piece of trash. Well, that's their group. Right. <laughs> yes. So how do you you determine me? This is me now. That oh, okay. you're really hearing his voice. So I think you walked in and I already had it up here. But when you hear God's thoughts, it produces three effects. The fruit, Galatians five twenty two. So the voice of the Lord, the Lord causes an effect. So the fruit of the Holy Spirit, Galatians five twenty two. The second one was the logos. It ties to the Logos, what God has said to people in the past. And I forgot what the third one was. Let me see if I could read my own scribblings here. Comes as thoughts. Oh, it comes as thoughts. Mm -hmm. uh, 1 Corinthians 12. Mm -hmm. Gosh, I, I mean, it's hard to read writing, and then I've erased it in writing. <laughs> <laughs> trying to get it. So in 1 Corinthians 12, it tells you that the voice, of, how do you recognize it? And so the main way that the Bible talks about God speaking to you is its thoughts. Thoughts come in three categories also. Feeling, pictures, and uh, concepts, words or phrases. Okay? Does that help? Did that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. No, no, you bet. Yes? Does you ever start a thought with 
um, with the word I, like as if it's like, like you think it's you thinking it, like it's like, man, I was really impatient there, <laughs> or I was really mean or something. What what you'll what it'll be is <clears throat> God's thoughts are almost going to feel like your thoughts. You just yeah. have to weigh them. That's why you have to develop the whole idea of testing and weighing. That's why it's, the Bible tells you it's, your focus is to hear the voice of the Lord, and then the second main focus is testing and weighing it and learning to sharpen that skill because God is talking and men don't perceive it. So a lot of times when God is talking to me, most of the time I don't recognize. The same thing when the enemy is talking to me. I don't recognize it's not my thought. I just hear the thought, and then I start musing with it. Oh, why would I be afraid of that? And then I start entertaining it. And then it takes me three hours to recognize, oh, that's actually a demonic spirit talking it. Or when God's saying, now go over there and talk to that person. Eh, that doesn't sound like a good idea. And, I, and you know, <laughs> I'm doing all that. And then I recognize, oh, that's the Lord telling me to do that. So everybody goes through that. That's what, what's so hard is people think it always has to be this distinction. Like it's an outward audible voice, which God could do, but that's not daily guidance. It's not always... Hey, dog, it. but you go over here and do this. <laughs> and so because it doesn't have that tonal distinction, it just comes as a thought. We're just like, well, that just came out of my own heart. And so that's why you have the scriptures. It shows you God's thought through his history, which represents his nature. So his thoughts follow his nature that he's already given us in the Logos. So that keeps you from error. Spiritualists, do you know what a spiritualist is? There are people that connect with the spirit realm, but they have no discernment. So any thought they recognize in the spirit realm, and they'll go and stick a needle through their hand thinking it's the God of the universe in one second, and then they need to repent of their sin. So they hear from God one time, and they hear from the enemy the other time. So they're doing all this weird, bizarre junk. Because they're spiritual. They have nothing to ground it in. God's given you the word to ground it. Because God's reflecting his nature in the word. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. Questions, comments, or statements? Okay, let's pray. You guys pray? Ready? So, Father, we just bless you. You know, so, Lord, I see this as something because you, out of your kindness, let me study this for years. But as we're learning it, help connect these concepts. And, and really, you're the one that, by your, your own voice in our lives, you're the one that lights upon these things and begins to show us. So build these things into us. Let us get a assurance from you speaking to us so that we're not thrown to and fro, not knowing and recognizing your voice. Everyone here was created to hear you, restore their confidence that they are hearing from you and help them grow in this. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen.